Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2021-2022 Medical Admissions Timeline sort of update, who we are, what we are, what we're doing in COVID. My name is Dr. Anita Pascal, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar. Um, you guys are all in listen-only mode, but if you have questions throughout the presentation, I encourage you to post them in the chat box down below. And when I'm done, I'm hoping to allow about 15 minutes at the end so we can engage and sort of figure out what all we need before we get started. Started. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of information and I'd like to find out a little bit about you guys. So, first of all, who am I? My name is Dr. Anita Pascal. If you haven't worked with me before, I have been doing, I'm a dinosaur. I've been doing this forever. I've over 20 years, I've counseled well over 10,000. I'm actually probably getting close to about 18,000 students now. Um, my background is for all of you guys who are hoping to go to med school, I've been just like you. I am an MD. Um, I received my medical degree from Chapel Hill. My background and experience is reproductive health and family planning. So double boarded family medicine, OBGYN. Um, I have a master's degree in education and two PhDs in physiology and pharmacology. Don't be impressed, didn't want to get a job. But um, I spent a number of years working for the World Health Organization and USAID before then serving as um, a director of um, undergraduate pre-health studies at an R1 institution. And then I've actually served on over five medical admissions committees and currently work with several schools, three in the top 10. So I should give you some ideas, but um, very well connected in the medical community, but my real goal is to help you guys figure out how to stand out in the sea of applicants. So today's talk is to take a little bit of focus to look at what the stats were like last year, sort of what you're up against in this competition, and most importantly, how you make yourself stand out to committees. And um, we'll touch base with that in just a few minutes. So again, I'm gonna give you a background and overview from the past year. We're gonna talk a little bit about the timeline and then how you really want to sort of set yourself up best for success. So before I get started, just so I know who all's here and kind of what the group is we're working with, why is my poll not opening? There we go. Um, can you tell me, just a little bit and let me launch this poll. If you could just click on when you're planning to apply, if you've already applied or those of you planning to apply this upcoming cycle. So really what this is tailored to the 2021, 2022 folks or folks a couple of years um, down the road, 23, 24, because I'm really trying to get a sense of when you're thinking about and the things you should be targeting. Oh, this is wonderful. So looks like everybody's pretty well spaced out between applying this upcoming cycle and in in the next one to two years. So that's great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Let's get going so I don't waste any of your time. So let's talk about what it takes to get into med school. And most of my pre-health applicants are bright folks. You knew you were going to get into college when you applied. Um, you were bright. You may not have gotten into every college you applied to, but you were going to get in somewhere. But medical school is so different. On an average, what we're looking at is every year more students get denied than actually get accepted. So these are last year's stats. So the average person submitted about 17 to 17 schools. So if you figure that there were over 53,000 applicants to medical school last year for 22,000 spots, okay, we had an acceptance rate, and last year was actually pretty good. Um, that acceptance rate was higher because a lot of people sort of backed out and took times um, deferred because of COVID and concerns with that. So they actually offered more acceptances. Um, for the past few years, it's been wavering somewhere between about 40% and 41%. So last year was just a, a tick higher. But if you consider 53,000 applicants applying to a minimum of 17 schools apiece, you're looking at almost 9,000 applications. The average school, the average med school is going to get around 11 thousand applications. 11,000 applications that have to be whittled down to three to 500 interviews they're going to grant. And out of those, a hundred or so that are going to get acceptances. So the biggest thing to start out the gate is you are in a very competitive pool, a competitive pool where people are bringing a lot of the same things. And every school is filtering through 
over 10,000 applications. So there's going to be a screening criteria that's going to be a baseline. And then once you get through the screening criteria, what else do you bring to the application? What is going to make you unique? So the goal is to get the things that you need, but also establish what your brand is. And we're going to talk a lot about that word, your brand, and what that means. So if you look at the stats, if we say that about 40% are accepted, that means 60% get denied. But of those 60% who get denied, about 50% of those kids have strong GPAs and MCATs. And this is one of the first mistakes that I see a lot of people make. They place a tremendous focus on getting that 4.0 GPA or somewhere close to it and getting that super strong MCAT score. Okay, that is very, very important because the base screen for almost all medical schools is when your application comes through, they're gonna screen on what your total GPA GPA and what your MCAT is and do you meet their base criteria. So when you start looking at schools and where you want to go, you need to be very realistic. Okay, we're going to talk more about what the averages were, but where you fall into that. And every, every year it's always so difficult because I get kids who I know really have the heart are going to make great physicians who really just don't have the metrics of where they need to be. Maybe that MCAT, maybe that GPA, maybe both are a little low. And they say, but I really, really want this. I really have the heart. And I totally respect that. And most of those folks are going to make fine physicians. But if you're filtering through such a great number, you've got to have base screening criteria. So the first is making sure that your GPA and your MCAT are strong. And if they're not, what do you need to do to fix that? But then after that is, what do I bring to the table? What are the key components that are going to make up my application? Have I added to them throughout my whole journey? And do they signify that I understand this course? We're going to talk more about that. So let's look at the numbers over the past few years. And what we're seeing are these numbers are continuing to rise. So if you compare the number of applicants to matriculates, every year we're seeing that not only is the mean MCAT score going up and the mean GPA, but so are our number of applicants. So we did have one year, a couple of years back, and it was actually when we were changing the MCAT that we saw a pretty big blip. But every year we're seeing an increase in the average MCAT applicants. So um, in terms of those who applied, of that you know, 53,000 individuals, the average ap applicant MCAT was about 506 last year the average GPA was around a 3.5 with a science GPA of around 3.4 and these are numbers from last year so this past application cycle of the people who matriculated this year again we're continuing to see this MCAT score tick up it was 508 then 510 then 511 now we're inching closer to 512 for the average acceptance matricula, the kid who went to med school, and that average GPA of closer to 375. So we're continuing to tick closer. So this is those who applied versus those who were accepted. If we're looking at the number of applicants versus matriculates, again, we saw a slight increase last year. Actually, this year, surprisingly, in COVID, we're seeing application numbers up almost 17%. Um, there has just been a huge increase in applications. And I actually sort of thought we might see the numbers fall off due to co fear of COVID, but what we're really seeing is more people wanting to be part of that healthcare process to make a difference. Um, if you're looking at male to female, the average matriculate this year was actually a little closer to 25 26 so again we're continuing to see that age number creep up and that is because we are seeing more and more med schools really liking the kid who has taken a gap year taken that time to further explore and gain additional experience um, if you're looking at those who are applied and those who are accepted male to female um, there was a slightly higher number of females to males that applied and matriculated and this is actually the first year where we've really seen the split in the number typically we see a little bit of the division in those applied but the matriculate numbers tend to be pretty 
close. If you're looking at in versus out of state, this is pretty much to be expected. Um, we are going to see that there is a wider number of people who may apply out of state but ultimately matriculate in state. That is due to two things. Number one, most in state supported schools are going to be more affordable. So if you're looking at the bottom line, but also higher preference for in state students, especially state supported schools. The competition contends to be, continues to be difficult for international applicants. They compose about 2% or 2.5% of the total applicant pool. And um, we actually saw an 11% acceptance rate for these kids. So instead of 40%, 11%, but that's actually up almost 25%, 28% from years past. Um, in terms of osteopathic numbers, um, these numbers are still, we, we don't have the final matriculate numbers. Um, um, Acomas is still at um, sort of ferreting out those final numbers, but what we did see here again was an increase in the mean GPA um, to an estimate of about 504 for a matriculate and an increase in the GPA to about 3.5. And we've known historically that osteopathic programs may take a slightly lower MCAT score or GPA, but the advantage is, and what we did see this year, is this was the first year that residency applications were open to MD and DO applicants, people from osteopathic and allopathic programs applying for the same residency programs and this past year we actually saw um, that those numbers were all um, consistent with 94 to 94 percent acceptance into residency placement on the first round for both MD and DO applicants. So that prior stigma of I'm afraid to go DO because I may not be able to get a slot has somewhat been taken away and again that's going to be very dependent on your ultimate board score. When we're looking at in versus out of state by region, um, I always think this is a very interesting thing because if we break it up into the Northeast, Central, South, and West, if you notice in looking at these numbers, the South comprising everything from Virginia all the way down through Florida and over to Texas. So that's a big swath of individuals. So that makes up a large portion of these applicants. But look here, Cal the West is just California and Washington State comprising, again, more than a quarter order of our applicants. Um, so if you're looking at the numbers that matriculate in and out of state, we already know this to be true with California. It is much more difficult for those residents to matriculate into their state. So we will see more of that, a higher percentage matriculating out of state. We also see the same thing here in the South with these greater numbers across these areas. And then again, the numbers of those who did not matriculate running about 60%. Okay, um, another interesting point here is that um, I thought it was interesting to look at the mean MCAT and GPA by race and ethnicity. Um, we still know that white Caucasian individuals make up a large preponderance of our applicants, but it was um, exciting to see this year an increase in our Hispanic and Latino applicants. Um, we had a very small drop in, among our African American population, but with our desperate need for um, um, individuals to care for these populations, really hoping to see to con a continued rise in these numbers. Um, but if you're looking at the numbers for matriculate by GPA and MCAT score within these populations, we also notice that into MD programs, we do have a wider range of MCAT score acceptances and GPA. So this is very, very encouraging. That is not a gold standard, but it does know that we there is a little bit more grievance given in those areas. Um, again, if you're a non if you're a non-US resident, we are going to expect out the gate a higher GPA and a higher MCAT score. So rule of thumb is if you're searching by schools and you're trying to figure out where your scores fall, you should take the median MCAT and GPA for any school. So if you pick up the MSAR, every school will have a range of acceptances but if you're trying to build your most competitive list you want to look at the mean MCAT and mean GPA for that particular school. If it is an in-state school a state supported school and you are an in-state resident then you should look right at that level if it is an out-of-state state supported school so say you're a resident of North Carolina like me you're looking at a state supported school in Virginia if it's a state supported school your target score should be at least two MCAT points above their mean and one GPA point above their mean. 
again, um, for an example, if you're looking at a North Carolina school that maybe has a median MCAT score of 515 and you're an out-of-state applicant to that state-supported school, then you're probably going to be screened at about a 517. So that's for state-supported schools. If they are private schools, a target school will be at their median GPA and MCAT. A REACH school, one that you aspire for, will be two to three points above that. And what we call a safety school, although with 40% acceptance rates, there really isn't such a thing, we typically say a couple of points below that. So when you're building your list, the average applicant is going to apply to seven to 15 schools, although last year we saw that tick up closer to 17 to 18. And um, the on a good year, what we generally say, and this is something to think about, a large, and I mean a very large number of schools are automatically going to send secondaries whether you clear any of their criteria or not. So if you say that you apply to 20 schools in a very good year, you would expect to get secondaries from 18 to 20 of those schools because so many are automatically generated. In a good year, you would hope to receive three to five interviews for one acceptance. So very, very different from college. So going in, you want to think about how do I make myself most competitive to get to those three to five interviews to get that one acceptance or more. So getting into med school, I would like to say it's like moving from college athletics into the pros. So if you were a really, really, really good high school athlete, you might qualify and get a scholarship to college to play your sport. My husband played soccer. I was a gymnast and a cheerleader at my college, but there was no way that I was going to be an Olympic gymnast. There was no way he was going to play in the Premier League for soccer. It is such a difference between being a college athlete and a pro athlete and it is the same thing. So for a lot of pre-med applicants to everyone around them with a 3, 4, 3, 5 GPA and all the things you're involved in and everything you're doing, you look really, really impressive. But when you stack up against 10,000 other applicants, you've got to figure out how you stand out. So when we think about the timeline, if you're thinking about applying in April, in sorry, May or June of 2021, you need to start thinking about putting your application together now. You should have already comprised the components of your application, but this is the timeline that I work on with my students. This is what's typical. So starting next month into December, the kids that I work with, we're going to start brainstorming their personal statements, kind of building the framework of what they want to say, how they want to articulate their journey, because you've only got 5,300 characters counting spaces. And I get people all the time who are like, oh dear God, how do I say everything? It is not supposed to be war and peace of your life, not that length. We're looking, can you articulate why you want to be a physician? But even more important than drafting your personal statement is comprising the list of what are going to be your experiences. AMCAS and ACOMAS, as well as Texas, allow you to list all of your experiences. So for example, AMCAS gives you 15 experiences, three of which you will tag as their most meaningful. Those experiences should demonstrate your competency in research, your clinical understanding. So there are all types of categories that you list your experiences in. So the first thing that you should do if you're getting going to apply next year is sit down and make a list of everything you've done and then take AMCAS's categories such as non-paid clinical experience and figure out how many things fit in because remember I told you the first screen is going to be on your GPA and your MCAT the second screen is not looking at your personal statement it's looking at your experiences it is going to look at the, the number of experiences the strength of those, meaning how long you have done them and the total number of hours, and then how you articulate that particular experience. But before we ever read it, almost all of our schools, we do an electronic screen for your experiences. It will spit out a grid that sort of weights it by service, 
clinical exposure, research, the number of hours, and give it a weighted score. I have an astronomical number of students who get weeded out at that particular level. So they'll get through the GPA and the MCAT, but remember I said 50% of the people who had that score get denied. The most common next reason is not having enough experiences. AMCAS has what they call their 15 core competencies. That is not a one-to-one -one correlation between 15 experiences and competencies. Some experiences will radiate multiple competencies, leadership, research capability, critical thinking, potentially clinical exposure. Other may not. Okay, but they may add more strength to your application. So between now and January, it's very important to figure what experiences you have. And if you're lacking, can you complete those or get those into play before you submit your application? Because you can't put anything on your application you haven't started. And if not, can you get them done or should you maybe take that treasured gap year that we talk about? So I like to have my students draft their first rendition of their personal statement and their experiences to me no later than January or February. That is why I've got so many students already signed up now because we're making sure they've got the things they need, but so that we can start working on this so that we take January to May to get everything together. So the first round of their personal statement and experiences will come to me the first part of the year. That will allow Allow March for a second review and April for a third review. The next thing is to also start gathering letters of recommendation. Whether you're using a schools committee or you're gathering those on your own using a letter service, you want to start approaching the people who will write your letters of recommendation for you. You need to focus on having a minimum of two academic, ideally three. We generally say two science, one non-science because there are a few schools that want a non-science. From there, building additional letters that reflect your things you've done. Maybe you've done research. One of the red flags to us is if you list three years of research, but you don't have a recommendation letter from your, from your principal investigator, or you've maybe worked as a scribe or in a job or as an EMT, or you've got tons of clinical shadowing with a physician, but there's no clinical letter. Or if you've maybe been heavily involved in starting a foundation, but there's not a letter from somebody to support that. So start gathering your letters of recommendation now and either submitting them to your school's committee or gathering them in a letter service so that when the time comes for the application to open, you're not having to use AMCAS's letter form to get those letters in May. You don't have to have all your letters available before you submit, but the longer it takes to get them in, the more it can slow your application process. So begin drafting your personal statement, thinking about your experiences. Work to target a first, second, and third draft between January and April. Also make sure to give your start gathering your letters of recommendation. I always tell them, tell my students to get tell their letter writers to submit no later than April 30th. People always lag behind. That'll give you into May to gather those. This will allow you when the applications open in May to send your transcript if you're still in school as soon as you get your grades and start keying your application. This way, as soon as AMCAS and ACOMAS are open for submission in Texas, you can submit immediately. Why do you need to submit immediately? Because it takes four to six weeks, and we already saw this year with COVID and delays, it was taking over eight weeks for applicants to get verified. So you want to make sure that you get verified early on so that when the application process opens to schools, for schools to look at your application, you're already verified because schools will not be able to send to you until you're verified. So you want to submit your primary application in May and June, and then when the secondary start coming out in July and August, or if you're looking at a Comus in Texas, that's going to be in May and June, you can use this June timeframe to be pre-writing and focusing on these secondaries. Your goal when it comes to secondaries will be to turn these around in two to three weeks, if at all possible. Um, I will tell you guys, in January, I will be doing a um, webinar strictly focusing on personal statement and experiences. In May, in April, I will be doing um, an ex 
a um, webinar on how to make the most out of your application and avoid common pitfalls. And in July, I will be doing a webinar strictly dedicated to making the most out of your secondaries. Your goal is, is if you can get these in early enough that between August and January, you will be starting getting interviews. And again, we're hoping to score just three to five. Um, that's, that's considered a good year. The problem what we see is many people wait until this April or May to start drafting their personal statements realizing that they're way behind on the other parts of their application and they submit too late so they get interviews later and secondaries later and all of this enrolling applications can be the nail in your coffin. All right, so we know the primary application is going to open in May. Okay, secondary applications come out around July and August, and then interviews are anywhere between August, January, and February and beyond. And this year, we already know that's gonna extend well into March and probably beyond due to delays in the application cycles. First acceptances for MD programs can come out mid-October. Final decisions are due by April 30th. DO and Texas for DO, they can start accepting anytime once they start conducting interviews. And Texas, because they have the match system. You're looking at pre-match in the October time frame and their first match in November with final in February. All right, so let's get to the numbers and what you're going to need to put together. So the average admitting GPA is going to be admitting 365 to 375. Okay, so if you're coming in with that average applicant GPA of 3.4 to 3.5, you've already got something. That doesn't mean you're not going to make it through a screen, but it's going to be one thing that's going to put you a little bit behind the pack of what we're looking at. If your GPA is in the 3.4 to 3.5 range and you're not falling into specific underserved categories, you might want to A, consider osteopathic, or you might want to consider adding master's level coursework. General rule of thumb is 30 hours of coursework or at least a one or two year science-based master's or as a substitute up to 20 hours, 20 to 30 hours of master level classes not taken as a part of a curriculum. But if your issue is your GPA, it needs to be a science-based master's. There are tons of those out there. Um, the other thing is I often have people who go, I'm gonna start my master's, but I'm gonna go ahead and apply. Well, they have no, no yardstick to measure you by. You don't have any coursework, so you need to complete at least one year of that master's. Um, we're seeing more and more schools are taking both MCAT and GRE. You need to do your research on this. Most fall-based programs accept applications between about January and March. Again, some later, some earlier. And they there are um, matriculations that do start for master's programs in spring and early summer that may allow you to finish faster. Again, the average MCAT score for screening is around 510, and we're seeing the average admission score of around 512. Um, like we talked about, if the average um, accepting applicant is 365 to 375, but um, same thing for your MCAT score, typically what we say is 509, 510 makes it through screens, 512 makes most schools feel like you understand the concepts, and around 516 starts to catch the attention of medical schools. Again, we're looking for a GPA better in this range. We do know that a strong MCAT score overrides a slightly lower GPA. So if you're a 512 to a 515, but your GPA is more in the 34535, that will help offset it. However, if you're a 40 GPA with a 495 MCAT, it will crush your great GPA. The other thing is, is that one of the most common mistakes, the other two most common service mis um, experience mistakes I see are not enough clinical experience, a minimum of around 100 hours in three to four disciplines, and that's a total. Last year, the average was close to 500 total hours of clinical shadowing. We say diversity over quantity, so it's better to see three to five different areas that you've shadowed in versus 500 hours in anesthesia. We're wanting to see that you've really gained an understanding of your career choice, and paid clinical trumps shadowing every time. We really like to see that you've engaged, gotten out there, rolled up your sleeves, and engaged with the patient population you're working with. Time and time again, I hear people say, why do you want to go to med school? And it's like, I want to help and serve and make a difference, and I love science. And honestly, those are all great reasons for wanting to go to med school, and they should be your reasons. 
but understanding that the journey to healthcare is not about being a physician. It is not about taking care of patients, even though that's what you do. It is not about the diagnosis. It is about understanding that your patients are people. Those are people that you are helping give better lives, give them back to their families. But also, we want to know that you understand what you're getting yourself into. It's not just, I'm going to take care of people and let them lead healthier lives. Tragedies happen. People face death. People face cancer. People lose loved ones. Understanding that impact on family, just like we're dealing with with COVID right now, unexpected losses due to COVID, being sheltered away, people experiencing mental illness that is exacerbated by COVID, how all of those things fit in together and are you ready to take care of those populations? Remembering that if your credentials are lower, even with the best intentions, you're fighting with 10 plus thousand people for a slot. Take the time that you need to make your application the strongest because if you get denied, and time and time again, I get people going, I just really want to give it a try, and that's great, but A, it's expensive, B, it's time consuming, but most importantly, many times if you get rejected, two things happen. The screening criteria for reapplicants is going to be more stringent than first-time applicants because we expect you to fix the reasons you didn't get in. The other side of it is we're seeing more and more schools saying we will not interview the first year after you've been denied for exactly that reason. They expect you to have fixed those gaps. Also, be open to learning about and considering osteopathic as a career path. Osteopathic physicians do exactly the same training as MDs with additional training in more holistic body medicine and um, manipulation, et cetera. It is, I always say it's like all the training I got as an MD with an additional bag of tricks. It is an uh, excellent opportunity, especially if maybe doing a one-year master's is not financially feasible, or if you really haven't learned about that type of program, there are phenomenal DO programs. And then again, if you are still struggling in this range, to consider one of the strong Caribbean programs out there. N nobody goes in, or very few people out the gate so I want to be an MD, I want to go to a Caribbean school, I want to go to osteopathic, but learning the course and the number, the opportunities available to you to help you achieve your dream. And I worked with two applicants who went to Caribbean schools last year. One is now in residency in Stanford, one's in residency at Duke. It is about what you make of your time. So like we said, a strong MCAT score can help a lower GPA, but a poor MCAT can negatively affect your GPA. These are the 2021 test dates that have already been published. Notice yet again this year, no dates in February, not exactly sure why. Um, the MCAT registration for March and January will open on November 10th, so January through March. Um, Pre-registration starts on November 2nd. This year, they will be offering two test slots on every day, so that will double our number of test opportunities, which is great. Um, however, in COVID, they were going to two-week turnaround. They're going back to one-month turnaround to get your scores. If you look at the breakdown, you know, you're looking at a testing time of when you're actually in your seat, um, six hours and 15 minutes, but with breaks and everything, you're looking at seven to eight hours, so it is an endurance test. One of the things, the biggest mistakes I see people make in preparing for the MCAT is they study content and not enough practice tests. You should be doing every practice test available to you before sitting for that exam because it's like training for a marathon. Generally, what we talked about is that most people are here in around the 500 to 504 range in the 50th percentile. Your goal is to be here or higher in this 510 threshold to what we say the 512 make some breathe a sigh of relief to where you're starting to turn heads. So this is sort of your goal. And this is the percentage ranks from this past May and April. Um, going, that, these will be the percentage ranks going forward, sorry. Um, and these are the, the scoring percentiles. So again, if you're considering that the average person is here in the 503 to 506 range, that's about the 60th percentile. And we're looking to get into at least the 85th percentile. And once you're hitting the 93rd to 94th percentile, this is where I said we really start to turn heads.
Now, I want to take a few minutes before I open things up for questions to just talk about your experiences. Because remember I said that the first line screen is going to be on your GPA and your MCAT. But your 15 experiences, I want you to think about them in like five categories. Sort of what is your academic and what comprises your academic, and that's more than just your GPA. Your clinical experience, your leadership capability, your service outreach and your social, your sort of outside interest, okay? So when we're talking about academic, outside of your GPA, research is very, very important. It is not a deal breaker. We don't expect you to be published, but research generally should be a minimum of a semester, ideally a year. It's not as much about publications unless you're really looking for a research intensive medical school, but it is about being able to demonstrate you understand what research is about, the time it takes to conduct research, and the two biggest wins are if it's lab-based, so it's wet lab-based, or it has a clinical application where maybe you have patient interaction. Um, when we're talking about teaching and tutoring, as a physician, one of the main things you're going to be expected to do is to educate and talk to your patients. Have you developed the skills to learn how to take complicated information and explain it in a way somebody can understand? So great opportunities right now because we're really dealing in COVID. And I'm hearing people who are like, but I'm studying online. How do I engage in research opportunities? How do I get wet lab experience? So so until you can get back on campus, there are two things, because many researchers are continuing to engage in on-campus research. So check with your Office of Undergrad Research, email your professors who might still be engaged in research. The other thing is to look and to think globally and locally. Look for clinical research organizations within your hometown or area that might be hiring volunteer interns. When I worked for Family Health International and USAID, we always took vo volunteer pre-med interns to help with our work. So explore more creative opportunities. Look for potential hospitals or physicians who are engaging in clinical research within their practices. When we're talking about teaching or tutoring, if you're not on campus where you may be able to serve as a TA, maybe you can be a virtual TA. Look for virtual tutoring opportunities within your community. So many kids right now are having to learn virtually. Maybe you can serve as a virtual tutor. Study abroad. It's great to study abroad, but the purpose of study abroad is about gaining cultural exposure, understanding different cultures, backgrounds, religions, and different socioeconomic classes. So potentially maybe independent travel you've done on your own, maybe medical mission trips, maybe um, your background or your heritage or your family, or even just within your own communities, engaging in refugee support groups, international um, welcome committees, maybe tutoring for people who are trying to pass the U.S. citizens exam, maybe volunteering in free clinics or volunteering as a translator within the hospital if you're bilingual. So think about ways that you demonstrate cultural appreciation. Again, different backgrounds, religions, socioeconomic classes. When we talk about clinical, we already touched on this earlier, but you should aim for a minimum of 100 in at least three to five different disciplines or areas. Um, and then paid clinical is always a plus. If This is where the gap year always comes in. So you're working to complete everything else, and then you take a year to do nothing but work in the clinical environment. If not, look for part-time opportunities, things you can do on the weekend or after school. Um, I worked as a, an MA in a burn unit for all four years while I was in college. I worked every weekend, I worked every holiday, I worked every summer. Then I worked part-time um, as, as a waitress and I also worked as an RA. So there are all kinds of ways that you can balance how you get that clinical exposure. Um, there are also a lot of virtual shadowing opportunities available right now, and that's a good way to engage while we're still in COVID. When we're talking about service, um, a big aspect here is that we're looking that you've gotten outside your comfort zone to really engage in meaningful, selfless service where you change through your service. And I get this all the time. I mean, there are lots of opportunities to do things on your college campus, and I'm not wanting to belittle any of those, but things where you really have to invest part of your own spirit into it, engaging with different populations. So for instance, I list here becoming a big brother with big brother, big sister. So I've been a big for many years. I have a little 
that's what we call the you know the person that we mentor for and what i have learned from her journey and her life is all inspiring the things she's done the hurdles she's had to overcome at just 12 and 13 are phenomenal um, especially now in covid things that you might want to look at are getting involved in a crisis line we're seeing dramatic spikes in mental illness and um you know domestic violence etc from people who have remained caged in and sort of during this environment um, different things that have stressed us people who have graduated college and can't find a job who have lost their job another way is potentially volunteering with the VA or um, nursing homes to be a pen pal to the elderly who are now shut in um, where you can engage in regular service we like to see it for at least six months for at least 50 hours on a regular basis so i always tell my students you cast your net wide you shoot for five or six things to settle on two to three things if you're lacking on clinical or service at this point and you want to apply next year you really need to be aggressively targeting these areas so not only are you engaging in them for the next six months but it is something that you will continue for the next year leadership is also very important because strong leaders need to engender trust be able to get people to believe in their capabilities but also inspire them to feel part of a team so you want to take and be able to articulate examples of maybe where you stumbled as a leader regrouped and became a more effective team leader we are really looking to demonstrate at least two strong leadership experiences somewhere in the course of your journey and last is social experiences we're really looking at how you're going to engage with different populations and do you have personal outlets do you have things that you can do indoors or outdoors in times of stress i will tell you med school and residency are kick butt my son is an er resident right now he's logging you know 18 hour days in the icu um, he's an er resident but he's doing his icu time and he said he hasn't seen the light of day in like the past three weeks it's grueling and it's exhausting but we're all in it together but it is very important that you have a support system and outlets be it yoga meditation playing soccer hanging out with your friends playing video games international travel whatever ways that are going to potentially set you apart for instance again we talk about creating your brand so my son does twisted wire sculptures and one of the things that he created right before going for his residency room was interviews were twisted bonsai trees made out of twisted wire that he then wrapped over very small um, salt blocks the the salt lamps and then made zen gardens out of them and he said the people in his interviews were as interested in his woodworking and his handicraft as they were his background and journey you want to do things that are going to make you memorable so that's what we're talking about what makes meaningful personal statements and experiences and again you want to tune in in january but basically it needs to you need to get within your gut okay you want to think about it like five to six different paragraphs the first paragraph needs to catch my attention I want you to think about Netflix trailers that you watch that make you go I want to watch that and then it needs to tell a story it needs to share your journey you really really want to avoid cliches you want to watch overuse of the word I and that's going to be in your experiences too you need to avoid all the typical I really am empathetic I've always wanted to be a doctor avoid the those catchphrases like I get this all the time and in that moment and it's sort of talking about something they did and in that moment I knew I wanted to be a doctor and I swear every time when we're reading them in admissions it's like oh good lord find ways that you tell it from your gut so that when I read it I know that you really mean it make your admissions committee want to read that letter secondary applications again I told you your first screen is going to be your GPA and your MCAT your second screen is going to be your experiences your personal statement will give us a reflection of who you are but most schools are automatically going to send secondary applications the average secondary application is going to have three to five essays so I need you to do the math many kids go I'm gonna apply anywhere I just want to get in well I really appreciate that okay but if you apply to 20 schools and I get 20 secondaries from those 20 schools and they've got three to five essays let's just say four okay 20 schools four essays per school I got to turn around in two to three weeks holy crap 
In July, I may be faced with writing up to 80 essays. What we see is burnout, copy and paste, repeat errors, um, poorly articulated stories. Your secondary applications are responses to questions that the school is saying, we know all the basic stuff, we wanna know a little bit more about you. That's why I always have my students starting to pre-write their secondary application essays in June, so we're prepared for that. And then when we get to those all important interviews, now again, Typically, what we say is if you make it to the interview process, that means the school says, regardless of your GPA, your MCAT or whatever, if you shine at this, you're on equal footing. It can count up to 60% of the total interview process. So it is important, be it whether it's done by Zoom or in person, that you look the part, that you look professional and you act professional at all times, that you have good eye contact, that you have good intonation, and most importantly, you can articulate your journey. We hear the same answers over and over and over again to interview questions. You need to take the question we ask you, respond to it, and somehow reflect it back to your personal application so that when I come back and present you to committee, I can look down and go, oh, that's the person who spent the month in Zimbabwe, whose parent, fo parents fostered children or bred seeing eye dogs or whatever. What is going to make you unique and memorable that you stand out to us? Again, I told you, I cannot underemphasize the importance of gap years. Gap years to strengthen your profile, to experience the world. We are looking for somebody who has not just lived in the academic bubble, but has stepped outside of it, worked a job, worked with other people, know what it's like to pay bills, has truly worked in your profession. I have never had a student take a gap year that it did not benefit them. So get off that hamster on a treadmill that we talk about, like it's, I got to get through high school, I got to get through college, I got to get through med school because there's not enough time. You have tons and tons of time. It is making yourself the best applicant possible. So one quick thing is here at the TPR, we have all kinds of ways to help you. Prep for your MCAT, bring up your grades, and to help guide your application process. So if you could tell me real quickly let me get to my poll if you guys have an interest in any of these so i can follow up with you guys if where you are in your process you need more help on preparing for the mcat or what to expect um, how to navigate the med admissions process more specifically how i might be able to help you me or my team help guide your whole application making sure you articulate it the way it's going to stand out i i can tell you it is, it is such a difference when you can work through those. And if you might need help in tutoring support, um, just mark any or all of these and I will be happy to make sure somebody reaches out to you. All right, I'm gonna close that poll. All right, so our job is to help you get in. We can do that through great grades, great test scores, and admissions counseling. In terms of admissions counseling, I can help you with your primary, just your secondary, or start to finish. So we have comprehensive as well as premier comprehensive, which is strictly just working with me. Um, we also, and you guys will all receive a copy of this webinar. Um, you can actually go to our website and take our um, admissions quiz and schedule more time to find out. And please check out our free app that helps you guide your portfolio. So with with that said, before we go on, I want to see if I can pull up our questions, close the poll. It's kind of slow. So let me see. Down here, questions. Come on, give me questions. There we go. And I'll try to get to all of these that I can. Um, let's see. Will med schools take into account the last two years of grades if you have a big upward trend in GPA? We definitely look for an upward trend, but you've got to have enough of an upward trend that, had, that it has created that um, positive GPA. So if you're like a 3-5 and you're right on the border and you've had a very strong upward trend, that will have a weight over like a 3-2 GPA. Um, do we need to keep track of the hours we do um, to label our application? Very good question. It is actually totally on the honor system. 
Um, the big thing I'm going to tell you is when we look through those experiences, we're going to expect that they are reflective of reasonable amount of times. Like I had an experience page that I reviewed a while back and the girl had literally listed 4,000 hours for every single experience. And I'm like, did you not go to school? And so um, for the most part, you're on your honor system, but by the same token, let's say you listed that you shadowed for 500 hours in six disciplines and you've really only shadowed in one for 20, uh, you will very likely get nailed on that in questions that we may ask you in your interview, but it's totally on your honor system. If you're not applying next year, what are things you can focus on to strengthen the components components of your application? What should freshmen focus on fall and winter? So for freshmen in the fall and the winter, I always say use that time to explore the opportunities that your school has available. I definitely would start looking for potential research opportunities and in the spring look for an opportunity especially after your freshman year because if you can prep for the MCAT after your sophomore year to take your MCAT like the end of the summer and if you do well enough you don't have to worry about it in your junior year, the um, summer after your freshman year gives you the best time to potentially do an international mission trip or maybe some research or something really cool and engaging. So I would use the fall and the winter to explore potential clubs, look at research opportunities, investigate programs like your school ambassador program, TA and tutoring opportunities, really find your way, then use the spring to start engaging in some of those and planning the opportunities to go further from the fall. Because if you think about it, for kids who are wanting to apply after their junior year, you in theory really only have two and a half years to gather everything because spring is when we're putting together those experiences. So you need to start working on them now. The other thing that I would start doing is looking at the virtual shadowing opportunities, look at hospital volunteering opportunities, um, potential part-time work as maybe a CNA to engage in that, and then start looking for free clinics or ways to sort of volunteer out in the community. Are there workshops that help with drafting personal statements from the Princeton Review? Um, so like I said, I will be doing the webinar in January for drafting your personal statement. Um, we also have personal statements, strictly just personal statement review um, components where we not only review your personal statement, but we help you with the resources and we also have our packages that combine the support of drafting out your best personal statement. So I would definitely check out my webinar in January. It should be up on the website soon for you guys to register for it, but it'll be mid-January. Uh, where do they submit letters of recommendation? Okay, so um, there are applica letter application services that actually confidentially collect your letters of recommendation, like Interfolio and some of the others. Um, the way that AMCAS and ACOMAS does it is that there is a form that is attached that gives you a letter ID number that goes with every letter of recommendation and they get uploaded directly to the website. So if you're going directly through AMCAS and ACOMAS, you will have either your letter writer either uploaded electronically or or mail it to AMCAS, but if you use one of those letter services, they can actually hold all of them until it's time for your letters to be loaded to AMCAS and ACOMAS, and then you just attach that ID and transfer them yourself. They're confidential, so you won't get to look at them, but then you have control of it. Um, also, please check out to see if your school has a review committee or a health professions review committee that gathers your letters for you and figure out the timing, what they will hold and how you submit them to them. Um, is, that a, is that the step GPA and, or the overall GPA? Oh, this, I, I guess maybe the science GPA. So the first number I gave was the overall GPA. The science GPA tends to be just slightly below that. So the 365 to 375 is the overall GPA and the science GPA is around 36 for matriculates. Um, is the GPA average based on our science classes or overall GPA? It is both. There is an overall GPA and a science GPA. I will tell you that if your science GPA is significantly low, it outweighs the overall GPA. Session is being recorded? Yes, it is. And if you signed up for this, you will get a link for it. 
Um, how is unpaid scribing looked upon? Excellent question. Um, we typically say paid clinical being EMT, CNA, and scribe. However, it is more about the experience. So if you're a volunteer EMT or a volunteer scribe, it is considered as equal weight to paid scribing and paid EMT. It is about getting the experience. So maybe if you're working with a physician and they're willing to allow you to scribe for free, absolutely take advantage of that. Uh, will this approach to me? Yes, it will be recorded and sent back to you and it will be posted in our archives. Uh, would you recommend a graduate program before applying? Um, this is another really good question. We recommend a graduate degree program if you need it to address your GPA inconsistencies. However, if you have a strong GPA and weak experiences, you are better to use a gap year to focus on experiences, research, service, clinical, than an additional degree. If your MCAT and your GPA are both lower, a strong master's degree can help offset a little bit lower MCAT score as well. So like if you just can't break out of the 506 to 507, 5859, 509 range, but you get a 40 and a science-based master's, that will help offset that MCAT score. Okay, it, but that, it's not a super low score, but if you're right on the border, that will definitely help. What I have seen though, is some people with strong GPAs get a master's program, still deficient in the other stuff, and in your master's degree, we're looking for at least a three six or above in that master's level coursework. So I've seen a few of my students who had really strong GPAs and they did a master's and got like a three, two. That sort of says, I can't really do master's level coursework. So you wanna be really careful. That's why I always say, be careful about the programs you pick. The other thing is where we wanted your undergraduate classes, especially your prereqs to be done in person, not online, that was pre-COVID. Master's degrees can be done online, which really helps you to do a master's and also work. By the way, currently in situations of COVID, in the years to come, med schools, at least for the next year, will be more lenient in accepting online prerequisite coursework. However, please, 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 Always take those for a grade unless there is no option because you run the risk if you take it past fail, even under COVID situations of having a school expect you to retake those classes to demonstrate a course grade. Uh, if we apply in June of 2021, is it because we plan to extend fall? Yes, that is correct. You will apply June, May, June 2021 with the intent to start fall 2022. And by the way, schools are giving far, far fewer um, deferments, so you really want to plan to go. Uh, what is the average MCAT score for one who wants to apply to mainly DO schools? Um, the average applicant is going to be a 500 to a 504. The average acceptance is going to be around a 504 to a 506. Uh, are we able to use our high school experiences such as leadership or Red Cross ambassador? Unfortunately, high school experiences are not accepted on your application unless you're looking at Texas, um, unless it is something that you continued. So say you started as an EMT in high school and you continued into college, or maybe you are a Red Cross ambassador in high school and continued into college, then you can continue to count it. The only thing that from high school counts is stuff done the summer before you started college. Uh, international student, what are some of the advice that you have for international students? You want to be the cut at and the cut of above. You want to make sure that your GPA is at and above the national average, at least a 3.7. You want to make sure that your MCAT score for, if, if you're talking about a private school with an average of, let's say, 5.12. We said for most applicants as a target school, you should be at a 512. As an international applicant, think about an app like you're out of state. So you would want to be at least two points above that. And then you want to be strong in everything else. The other thing for international applicants is you have to be able to document a way to be able to pay for your education. Um, 
I have a very high undergraduate GPA. Should I risk the master's? So potentially how often do a master's? Um, you need to be very careful. If you have a high GPA and you're concerned about a master's potentially lowering it, again, like I said, if your GPA is really high, I don't know why you would want to get the master's unless you just want to add the additional coursework. You would be better off to focus that time on making the strongest other part of your experiences. And again, like I said, if your GPA is below a 3.6, a master's can actually hurt you more than it can help you when you complete it. Um, the other thing is, even if it's a one-year master's and you've got a high GPA, we generally are hesitant to accept somebody who has just started in a master's program because there is always this concern that if we accept you, you might quit. Uh, for the research, university is not allowing undergraduates to enter lab, so I'm doing it online. Will that count? Yes, it will count. Research in psychology will count. It will not be as heavily weighted as wet lab research or research that is sort of clinically based, but if you can tie it to it or potentially find a patient engagement part of it, but it is a great starting point for learning about the research process. So maybe if you can even log a semester or a year in that and then go to a different research experience later on. Uh, are leadership experiences outside of medicine battle? Oh, absolutely. Leadership outside of medicine and science um, and service are highly, highly looked upon. So like being an instructor in martial arts is an ex excellent example. Running your own class, teaching in something. I teach yoga, that's a great avenue to look at. So absolutely, we actually would prefer to see your leadership and service outside of just clinical so that we know that you are more multidimensional. Um, virtual scribing will count as, sh virtual shadowing will count as shadowing for most med schools. Yes, it will. Um, are letters by non-physicians, CNAs, and admin, admins still valid? They are, but not as much. Typically, we would rather have a physician, an FMP, a PA, or something along those lines, not generally a CNA or admin. Uh, general view on experience that has less health care, which we just talked about. We like military experience is a major plus. Love, love, love military experience. Um, all types of non clinical service is very highly looked upon, also for diversity of who you are. Um, there are way, holy cow, way too many experiences. Um, other questions for me here to answer. So I've tried to get through as many as I can. Um, we're going to try to, um, I will appoint somebody to look over the rest of these if you would like. I could take an additional 10 minutes to knock out as many of these as I can. If some of you guys would like to stick on the line, I'll try to run through these as well. What I don't get to, we'll try to also get to those questions in another format. Um, if you plan on taking a gap year, do you apply during the spring of your senior year or spring after your gap year. Okay, if you're planning on taking a gap year following graduation, you will apply in June when you are graduating such that you will be completing that gap year after you've graduated to start the following year. Again, some people take two and three years. Um, if you plan to take a gap year, should you be applying before or after? Um, ideally, what we say is that if you're going to take one gap year, you should apply as you're starting the gap year, but you want to already have things in process that you will be doing during that gap year, like a job or service or whatever, so that you can list and count those hours because then the gap year doesn't help you unless you've already started them. If you haven't been able to set up any of those things, sometimes it's better to do a gap year and then apply during your second gap year. Will doing something during your gap year not count since you have to submit your application early in the spring? And this is what we talked about. You don't submit early in spring, you submit in May or June, so you want to go ahead and have those things ready at the time that you submit your application. So you can, so like let's say you're starting a scribe job in May, but you're planning on doing it all the way through when you would matriculate the following August, you can estimate those hours going forward. Uh, you work as a direct support um, professional in a brain injury group home. I'm not working with doctors, but does this count as clinical? It absolutely does. Again, understanding clinical engagement is working with a patient, working with the other members of a healthcare team, and working directly with the family and the patient. So yes, this will count as clinical experience. Uh, this may sound insignificant, but I am... Uh, have a creative writing class, um, it's pass fail, but it's still GPA effective. Okay, um, a creative, a create an English class 
Um, so when we're talking about the core prerequisites, we generally want all of the sciences taken for a grade. We would like for your English to be taken for a grade, and that should be two semesters of English designated. Typically, one should have a composition, one should have a literature flavor, so it's at least a year or three quarters, two semesters or three quarters. However, Typically, if you have one pass-fail class, like in something like that, especially in COVID situations, they are going to generally look the other way right now. Do you have to specialize in military? Do you have? Do you specialize in military experiences to help create? Oh, absolutely. Um, I work with lots of military veterans, people who have come back after completion of their military service. Um, actually, have quite a few, and they're some of my favorite applicants to work with because really understanding that appreciation of discipline, leadership, service, and dedication to their country. So, absolutely. Um, are there virtual shadowing opportunities that you would recommend? Um, there are quite a few that we recommend and we've been sitting at, sending out on our dashboard, but you absolutely can shadow for them. Just understand that if you're searching, you are likely to be in a virtual shadowing room with like a thousand other people. Just document the exposure that you're getting. Uh, Non-traditional, 30 years old, work for eight years as firefighter paramedic. But that I feel confident in, uh, yeah, absolutely in your leadership and experiences. What concerns me are my service experiences simply because they're not varied enough and I'm concerned about the social experiences. Okay, so um, as a non-traditional applicant, we're going to have a little different weight on things. So non-traditional, we want to make sure that you've had at least continued academic engagement in a class or two within the past three years. So you've got to make sure where your core prerequisites are. The other thing is if you've been out for more than two up to three years, you may want to consider taking one or two online master's classes before you apply and during your application process to demonstrate you can still do that. When you're talking about where you've had years of working, um, experience as, as a parent and balancing those um, restrictions, working as a paramedic, engaging with patients, that is going to hold tons of clout. So what you may want to do is to just balance during this time frame before you apply, adding in some additional service so that you maybe have service from prior, from college, that back time, maybe stuff you've done with your church since then or whatever, and then current service to show your still continued commitment because we are looking for current time. So again, we talk about maybe volunteering with hospice, um, maybe helping educate other firefighters or paramedics, maybe serving as a virtual tutor for people needing tutoring right now. There are all kinds of opportunities like that. Do you know of any medical mission trips or blah? Um, we are actually starting to just now potentially see some study abroad programs like at Project Atlanta, Atlantis Project, and that starting to open up some of their restrictions post COVID. We really want to see what the spring is going to hold. So I'm really telling people to kind of hold off on that right now. Uh, this one. Uh, what is the best thing a sophomore should be doing right now? Ah, sophomore, taking stock of all of the things that you've already done. If you don't already have research, you need to be engaging in research. See where you are in terms of your clinical shadowing and target to get to the minimum by the end of next summer. Look at the service things that you're doing and you've already been involved in. Pick up maybe one or two things to do in your local community that is outside of the university. So if I would a, find something, some way to tutor, either engaging virtually, um, underserved kids, or with your school. Look at where you are in terms of research and gaining that. Aim to be on your clinical hours by the end of the summer. Also look at opportunities to engage in more service. We actually have, um, so like if you're not ready for one of the multi-year programs, which are more complex and give, a, give you full guided instruction, we do have subscription-based mentoring that for like six months and a year that is not as much messaging and not as intense, but does give you access at the premier level directly to me and at the other level to, um, to one of our comprehensive counselors, if you just want mentoring at that level. 
Um, for those who have graduated college and just started thinking about getting into med school, how should they navigate their admissions process? So it's allowing yourself at least a year to see where you are. Do you have your prereqs? Do you have the time to prepare? Where are you in terms of getting clinical experience? Can you complete all of that by June? If not, give yourself another year, um, but making sure that you're hitting all of those checklists. Um, are my top three uh, put into an algorithm with the GPA and the MCAT? It's not your top three experiences, it is your overall 15 experiences, and then we will more heavily weight your top three for what they encompass. Ideally, um, one of them should be clinical and one of them should be service related. The other, if you've done a lot of research, should be maybe research related or if you have a different um, multiple clinic. So we typically say try to shoot for one clinical and one service and then one either overlapping or in a different perspective. Uh, for applying June 2021 is because, oh yeah, we already got that question. Uh, what do you recommend for applicants taking multiple gap years before applying? So I've already touched on that. So multiple gap years is you want to make sure that you stay current in your coursework, that you take your time to get all of your criteria together, look at getting paid clinical and service, two really big ways to look at that. And then the bigger thing that I would say is remember the timing of your MCAT because your MCAT for a very few schools is only good for two years from the time you took it to the time you applied others it's three years so you don't want to take your MCAT too early. For science classes the classes are all prereq ones. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking but the core prereqs are two bio, two physics, two organic physics, um, I'm sorry, two, two gen chem, two organic chem, two physics, one biochem. Then you should have at least one semester of calculus, ideally two semesters or a full year to encompass all schools and at least one full year of English. Then use the MSAR to check individual schools for basic requirements. Some don't require two physics, but there are very few. Some will accept biochem for organic chemistry, but you're automatically gonna limit yourself if you don't hit the main core pre requisites. Um, I feel like I have no sort of guidance at my school. Would you suggest hiring my own pre-health advisor or do you know sites that? Yeah, and that's, here's the thing, and I'm not going to belittle any pre-health advisors because most, A, have not been to med school, don't understand the full background, and are really focused on making sure you get your class coursework contained, and only seeing you for 10 to 15 minutes a semester can really hurt. So that's one of the reasons we offer multi-year programs. So like for Ashman, we have in four, three and four years, so you can get guidance the whole time up to your package. And we also have six and 12 month just mentoring programs that really helps support that so you've got a way that anytime you've got a question you can just ping us on that dashboard to get the messages the answers that you need uh, what is the actual algorithm for admission experience or G GPA and MCAT are the first line screen the second line screen is going to be your experiences so you have to make it for through the first one to get to the second one um, I'm a senior now and I will graduate in the spring. I plan to take a gap year. Yay. Does that mean I will apply June 2021? Yes, it does. Also, how do I add experiences to my application that you haven't done? This is the point. If you're taking the gap year, you want to try to get everything set up to start no later than May, June, if you absolutely know it, and we can put a May start date before you submit your application. That is the key thing. Then you can estimate the hours going forward. Things you start after once you've already submitted your application can go to letters of intent and continued interest but they're, and be talked about in interviews, but they're not going to ha have the same weight. Uh, is there a weight given to the type of classes taken in undergrad? Uh, no, there is not an overall weight. Um, we do look at your performance year over year, but we don't break down that weight. There's just simply too many students to do that. Um, is there a way to ask questions outside of the webinar about more personal situations? Yes, actually on our website, you can schedule a time to speak with an enrollment officer and they can ping me directly with questions. Does the post back program help your application? Okay, this is really important. Post back, we need to be careful. If your GPA is an issue, 
more undergraduate coursework does not help you. post back if you're a different major and you need to take the core prerequisites is great, okay? Undergrad, post back prereqs. But if you're trying to address your GPA, you're better to look for one that either allows you to take master's levels classes or is a master's level degree, because that's what we're needing to see your performance in. Is age something I need to worry about? I had to delay the missions for two years for unless my family. Age is not an issue to work with. We only say that age becomes an issue if you are into your mid and upper 40s. Um, I had somebody in my class who was 54. We can't not discriminate on age, but age is important because we weight age based on your age the time that it'll take to complete residency and your likelihood for the time you will be able to contribute in the medical field. Um, could you explain what you guys consider a disadvantaged applicant? Um, disadvantaged applicant can be any type of scenario, first generation college, under uh, socioeconomic standards, differences in background, um, first generation immigrant to the US, um, any particular hurdles that you've overcome, be they financial, personal. There are lots of ways to look at um, disadvantaged applicant. AMCAS has a whole listing of what those are, are and you are actually asked to explain what those circumstances are and we can work with you on that. Um, I know I should avoid cliches in my personal statement but what if my reason for wanting to be a doctor is still considered cliche? And that is, I mean, it's perfectly fine to be cliche about it, but it's how you articulate it. How did you come to understand that this desire to help and serve and love science what are the things that you've done that demonstrate that? Don't tell me you always love science or as soon as I took biology, I wanted to play and dissect in my CAD. And it needs to be more meaningful than that because those are all the typical things that we see. Um, how would a completely non-healthcare related gap year look um, with some clinical regular work on the weekend, I'm considering healthcare consulting. Oh no, absolutely, healthcare consulting, working with people on EHR, learning the business of healthcare, engaging in people. If you are using your gap year to get work experience while you're making sure that you meet all of the other standards and you're getting all of the stuff in that you need to do, um, it's still good because maybe as a healthcare consultant, you're learning about the hurdles to healthcare and the barriers to healthcare. Maybe you're working with underserved populations, bridging those barriers. Um, oh, absolutely. It doesn't have to be the Germanic, you know, I was a scribe or a CNA. If you are meeting those requirements on the other side. It will not offset it if you still don't have like that clinical experience or service. Uh, what are some of the disadvantages of doing pass mail for med school aspects of it? Uh, pass fail is very easy to explain, especially in the core prerequisites. If your school allows pass fail in your general education classes, we don't care, okay? It's a little, little bit of a red flag to us, but not huge. But in the core prerequisites, your sciences, et cetera, we need a grade because for a lot of schools, a pass may be a D. We don't allow below a C minus. So we don't know where that falls. This year with COVID, especially in March, that was an issue. But now most schools have regrouped. If you can take for a grade, always take for a grade. Eagle Scout. Eagle Scout does count. Eagle Scout and the Gold Award is one of the things that from high school does count in your application. Can high school AP classes be used in, in place of core prerequisites and how do we submit them? Some schools will accept them, some will not. I always recommend if you have really key target schools, go ahead and check now. Um, the one that oftentimes schools will look the other way about is physics AP credit, um, but there are a lot of schools that will not take AP credit for biology, chemistry, physics, and um, well, you can't do orgo chemistry. So generally we recommend that if you get the credit, it's okay, you can show it, but it, you are going to limit the number of schools because of the number of schools that won't take AP credit. Now the rest of the AP credits, absolutely take every one of them you can where, where possible, but be very careful in the core prerequisites. If we're planning to go to med school fall of 2022, when should we take the MCAT? Does May 20, 
2021 work. May 2021 is getting on the later edge of it. Um, the best scenario is taking it the summer before you plan to apply. That way, if your MCAT score is not strong enough, you still have the spring to retake. But that's not an option for a lot of people because of getting prerequisite classes. So ideally, you want to take in the spring between January and April, ideally January to March, to allow a retest somewhere between April and June. Even if you test in, and what I always recommend is you test, you wait 48 hours and you sign up for a retest at least two to three weeks after you get your score back. Now, don't worry if your retest has to fall into June, because if you've already got a score, let's say your first score is really, really bad. You can still submit into in June to one super reach school, school you'll never get into. And that way you can get your application verified, retest in June, get that score back shortly after we release to schools and then add the rest of your schools. That protects you from applying to a whole bunch of schools and maybe getting a second score you're still not happy with and decide to take an additional year. So it's all really a game. See, you're only considered a re-applicant to any school that you apply to in your primary and maybe don't get into, all right? So let's say, you got a so-so score, you apply to a whole bunch of schools, you get another so-so score and you go, crap, I'm going to wait. Now you're going to be a reapplicant to all those schools, even if you do nothing else. So it's really important to know how to balance it. So test in the summer if possible, if not between January and March, April at the latest. Look to schedule a retest for May to June, depending upon when you test. If you test in May, try to test earlier in May, if at all possible. Uh, any tips for the Texas application? Texas applicants, exactly like our MD, but the same thing, you need to submit as early in May as possible, get your secondaries out in, in May, absolutely. So be on top of those. And because most of theirs are online at their website, as soon as you submit and they verify you, you can get, you can start working on those. Uh, been out of school for 10 years after a pre-med degree. I've been applying, traveling for 10 years as PR liaison. Everyone said schools are calling me like crazy, of course, um, because they don't follow the 10-year course rules. So should you consider Caribbean? You can consider Caribbean, but you've got to figure out where your MCAT score is. A lot of the Caribbean programs allow a pre, sort of pre-med, pre med pre um, class that's like a semester to get you up to speed. Uh, I actually work with all of what I call the big six programs. I really don't recommend outside of that. Um, and you really got to think about sort of what that means. Um, I can, oh good Lord guys, I cannot get to the rest of these. I'm going to have to break right here because this is, please, if you had questions that weren't answered here, um, please make sure to reach out and schedule an appointment to talk with one of our enrollment counselors because they can help you with all of those. But I want to thank you guys so much for your time. I hope I've answered your questions. Please make sure to sign up for my January webinar as well as my April and July webinars as soon as they're ready on the website for you guys. Have a great day. Great working with you.